what's up guys welcome back to cool friends beamer tech so today i'm back with another video um got another project actually this project is familiar um because i've done some work to this vehicle before so back today is the 2016 uh 428i so this is a four series with the n20 engine in here so um, this is referred to as a F32 um, two-door coupe, so 428i. So, um, I'm about to let you guys know in a little bit why it's back here and what I'm about to do to it. Um, so, this is the, um, like I said again, this is the one that, that I did, the expansion tank and the wire repair because of the um the coolant level sensor even though the coolant it had coolant in there it would it would say that the coolant level is low so um found out that the expansion tank was leaking through, at the sensor area through the sensor pins and also getting on the uh, wire a little bit of corrosion on the wire so i replaced the the connector in so um just walking around the vehicle checking it out um since the last time uh the the client has had some bumper work done it was in the body shop for a little bit because last time i had it um before he dropped it off to me i think he said something had hit something flew off of another vehicle i guess and uh hit the bumper area so it had a little bit of bumper damage the last time so it's got that fixed um i see he's a fsu florida state university uh florida seminoles fan so he's got his uh front front fsu tag on the front so all right so we're about to get into uh why this thing is back or why he brought it back i actually uh know why because i seen some um what i'm about to tell you guys about it's actually a coolant leak that he has but um I seen where it was about to start last time and basically so you can see I got this thing powered on so it's that's the check message you get engine coolant level low so it is a little low um I got it here in the garage I actually put it in here last night so it could be nice and cool um the only reason I was gonna, I'm gonna start it for just a brief minute is just to show you guys something. Uh, so I started up, let it run, and actually the, the check engine light went out. So that's what I was gonna show you guys. Check engine light went out, but it was on uh, when he uh, first brought the vehicle. So basically, um, to get my truck in the driveway the other day. Um, I started, I had to move this vehicle down just a little bit, so I started it up and moved it down and the check engine light was on, so, and he didn't, he didn't tell me that the check engine light was on, so I had to, uh, you know, I basically, uh, called him and let him know, I was like, hey, you know, the check engine light's on, and he said that it comes on from time to time, so, I mean, that's just something that's super important, especially if you're working on vehicles, uh, you know like I am or because I've been in the industry for a while it's just uh, you know if you see something you know you just let bring it to your the attention because I don't know if it just came on if it's something that's been on for a while so me talking to him confirming that you know so that's just a just a good uh, thing to be aware that that way me and him we both know you know that it's on because there are some instances you know just you know just experience of work you know working at a shop you know like the customers they get their car to check in light is on because you don't know exactly when it came on or it could have been on and they think it's something that you know that you did while you were repairing the vehicle so but uh i'm gonna get into talking about what's going on with it so i just popped the hood let me see what else i got going on here 
So um, I got my scanner. I got, my scanner is actually over there on that table. So got the R tail over there. So um, and I got my, my dongle down there. So that pretty much uh, it's like Bluetooth wireless. So this is pretty much what sends all the data over to the scanner. And I also got to let this customer know that the battery voltage on this thing is uh, starting to get low because uh, I can actually see that data on the scanner. I can see that um, I can see that the battery is low. The only thing when you, some of these when you close the door, it's gonna switch back off. So it's back on. So. So this is what I replaced last time. Replaced this the radiator cap, and I repaired the level sensor. And as we can see, um, the coolant is low. So the reason for that is I'm probably have to grab my light to show you guys. So just hang on for a second. All right, so I got my fender covers on here uh, to protect the paint in the fenders so uh, I don't scratch anything up so a major point of uh, when you're working on cars especially more higher end cars um, you know even though this one is a lot older but you know I always uh, pretty much I'm, I'm kind of the same way as if you know if I took you know like my my truck to the dealership or if I took my personal car to the dealership and things like that um, you know I want people to respect my property and and you know uh, things like that so you know I want to give this vehicle back to the client as he brought it to me so I don't want to damage anything or scratch anything things like that so um, that's just, you know, some professional courtesy. So I got my fender covers on here and I broke out the light. So this is my cordless. Uh, you guys probably seen this in a few of my other videos, but I um, got this off the tool truck. It's a Matco cordless uh, underhood light. So, I mean, I can make it brighter dim. So it's cordless. The battery, it, it lasts pretty, I want to say it lasts maybe anywhere between two and four hours depending on if you got it on high and low but I, I usually get a pretty good use out of it and then I got a cord that I can hook to it if I need to so wait a minute, where's my other flashlight so I got my other light here so we can kind of see uh, what's going on with the coolant leak so down here in the turbo area and, this, and I got to say this right here as far as on the N20, this is the worst uh, coolant leak that I've seen from this area here. So, um, what it is, the turbo coolant lines that are leaking. Um, it's a little tricky to see because I really can't get this camera down in there. Or at least I don't want to really get my camera dirty. So, I did take some pictures of it. And I can kind of show you right here. Uh, pretty much what's going on so you guys see right there uh, you know turbo coolant lines are leaking so so that's what I'm gonna be doing I'm gonna be replacing that so I'm probably I'm probably gonna you know let you guys know that this video um, it's probably gonna be more like of an overview of me uh, doing this job um, so, you know, some some of the videos I've, I've done have been a little bit of how-to and some of them just maybe me talking about features of cars and things like that. So, cool for it is Beamer Tech is going to be a multitude of, uh, of different stuff that's related to, um, that's related to mostly BMW, but maybe some other foreign vehicles uh, that I come across. So pretty much what I plan to do is um, I'm going to, because I will have to, because, you know, of course, like me and my garage here, I don't have, I don't have a lift. 
So, but I got a few ideas how I'm gonna jack this up. So, I'm probably gonna put jack stands under the front, and then in the back, I'm gonna. I got these um these little ramps, these oil change ramps. So I probably put those on the back. So that basically keep me ha from having to break out like four jack stands. But uh, so um. So what I plan to do is, uh, as I repair this, I got to take the turbo out and uh, a few other things. Got to remove the catalytic converter. Um, I may have to move that engine mount. I don't know, but I do have a support. I do have a. I do have a support brace in case I do have to to go that route. But um, I got to get all the trims and everything out. So. But uh, with that being said, all right. So I want to let you guys know. Um, you know, I, I kind of got into making these videos for fun. Um, uh, just kind of something to do. Uh, I kind of wanted to. How I started off doing it was with the, I call it Project E70, which was that thir 2013, um, BMW X5. It just had like a, I did a lot of repairs to it, and also tried to show you guys. Um, a few things you can do to kind of make some of the repairs cheaper by buying manufacturer um, matter, manufacturer branded parts. So it's still kind of like an aftermarket part, but they basically is made is ba the part this part is made by the same manufacturers that actually make the parts for BMW. So you can still get a good quality part versus having to stress out. You know, going to like your local auto parts store, which you're probably gonna get. Um, I guess you would call it a third, a third party, or an from another manufacturer, but that makes the part. It could be good or average or whatever, but in some cases with BMWs, I find that using good quality parts is better. So, if I'm gonna use aftermarket parts, I'm gonna go for the manufacturer brand as first choice if I can't get uh, from the from the dealer so but uh, on this vehicle on this 4 series here um, we got all dealership parts but for the project E70 um, since it was just you know a little bit of an older vehicle some some stuff did have to still come from the dealership but you know just as a um, just as you know, I, I thought it would just be a uh, kind of good project. I kind of wanted to do like a mini video series of you know just uh, repairing the vehicle. So I pretty much um, kicked off Cool Fresh Beamer Tech with that um, with that series right there. So one of my other channels is uh, Cool Fresh Garage, where I'm work working on other cars other than BMWs. Some of them are older classic cars and some of them are you know modern cars and trucks so um basically i'm just taking some time out just to you know let you guys just know who i am so my name is alfred i normally go by cool fred so that's why um i named my channels what i did so we got cool fred's beamer tech and then we got cool fred's garage so another thing is, if you like any of my content or my videos, please hit the like button to kick off the YouTube alg algorithm. So uh, by me making videos myself, I see how important that is to um, to hit the like button. So if I'm watching videos on YouTube, whether you know it's car stuff, which is mostly what I look at, but other stuff is like home improvement stuff because I'm doing a lot of repairs to my house you know what I'm saying I'm doing a um, I'm doing a shower and just a few little miscellaneous things around the house so if I see something uh, that I like out there I go ahead and I hit the like button because I, I just I see how important it is by me starting to make videos myself and um, if you like any me any of my other videos or you know if you want more content like this because it does take time to uh break out the camera and prepare to 
film some of this stuff. So, like I said, I do it for fun, but I enjoy doing it. Uh, so, I want to grow Cool Fred's Beamer Tech into something, you know, into, you know, a, a popular channel or, or whatever. So, if you guys can help me out by liking and subscribing, you know, or at least by liking the video, uh, that would be cool. So, and I'll try to bring some more uh you know unique content to the channel uh so typically a lot of times you know i really um on the time to time that i do work on stuff i really don't get a chance to um i want to say film it just because of time constraints or you know so i, I see kind of cool unique stuff all the time so and i probably got a few uh cool unique things coming up on some some of the newer engines um that we have they're not not necessarily like brand new cars but they're like you know like late model x3s like a 2019 2020 and a few things they have so they have that b series engine in them and you know they're starting to get coolant leaks this that and the other so um so if you guys like the the content, please subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. But at least the you know hitting the like button kind of you know kicks off the algorithm. So all right, so about to get back into it. So I got to I got to turn the ignition back on, so I can I can get my data from the scanner. So I've already scanned in the vehicle just to kind of make things you know just go a lot smoother. So it's already scanned in. So, um, and then these right here are some of the parts that I'm going to be repairing this bad boy with. So, we'll talk about those in a second. And, of course, like, I brought all my tools from, from work. So, um, so some of my tools are in this bucket. Some of the stuff I'm probably not going to need. But, um, so I got my electronic torque wrench. I got my coolant uh, vacuum filler. So, you guys probably wonder, or, or because, you know, of course, like I don't, I, I am a master tech. I've been doing this for 17 years, but here at the house, like I do, I do have, to, like it looks deceiving, but I do have lots of tools. Uh, I have some tools here, but, um, and at work, you know, which, you know, they're, they're my tools at work, but they're my tools. So I feel that I can take them with me whenever I choose to, cause I paid for them over the years. So 17 years of me working, um, on, you know on these type of cars so so I got tools so whether I'm working on on that over there or my truck or whatever you know what I'm saying but but pretty much what I do cuz you know what I'm saying of course I don't have a big uh, master toolbox in my garage that will insinuate that hey you know I'm uh, <laughs> you know uh, you know master tech but it's basically it's more about organization um and really to be honest with you like somebody who knows what they're doing uh, as long as you know what tools you need you can uh repair this vehicle any vehicle with um so a lot of the stuff is like the same old like you know using 10 millimeters um uh of course with bmw you got a lot of these you got a lot of these inverted torques and stuff like that. So basically, it's kind of, um, I really don't need a lot of specialty tools for this job. So that's one thing that helps. But I brought a variety of stuff to get into tight spaces and stuff like that. So um, so I got a lot of like e-torques, swivel sockets. Of course, I got some of my power tools. So pretty much, I mean, it's a lot about, it's a lot about, Kind of organization knowing like what job i'm gonna be doing and things like that so i'm able to kind of just bring what i need because you know 
some of these are common repairs. Like I just did one of these repairs um, at work on a 5 Series the other day. So um, I wasn't necessarily doing the turbo coolant lines, but uh, what I was doing, I replaced the oil feed line. So um, on the N20 on a, on a 5 Series. So I think it was like a 2015 or 2014 528i. So. It had a little smoke coming from the exhaust, so I put in the updated oil feed line or the oil supply line. So the updated one has a check valve or check ball in it that keeps the oil from draining back into the turbo and keeping the white smoke out of the exhaust. So, uh, so every now and again on my channel, I might I might drop a few gems or uh, you know a few things to let you guys kind of know what's going on with uh, some of the vehicles. So, I did scan this thing. So yeah, so that's the main thing. So this right here is like the little report. This is just a quick way to get in here to figure out like what all codes are in the car and stuff like that. So right off the bat right here. So that's a DME, the engine computer. And it tells you right here in parentheses what that module is. So basically we got radiator outlet temperature sensor electrical circuit short to be plus. So um, that could be one of two things. That means that this car probably uh, slightly could have overheated a little bit or maybe um, it um, detected that maybe the coolant was low. So, um, so the client claims that you know, he didn't run the vehicle hot or anything like that, but he has been topping the coolant off as he needs to. So, so but the radiator uh, outlet temp sensor, to be honest with you, I don't even know if this one, it may have one. I don't know if it's probably some of them in the radiator. Oh, it's actually right here on the top of the radiator. So that's the radiator temp sensor. So, and that one's a little higher up. So, um, so that one, because uh, usually the radiator is keeping things cool, so that means the coolant level probably dropped a nice little bit, and that sensor wasn't able to kind of sense the the temperature of the coolant. So, but I don't think you know he ran this thing hot to the point where it's steaming and uh, steam and smoke coming out of the hood. Because a lot of time, you know, a lot of people know that uh, that's been something. You know, my dad used to, to really, really talk about back in the day, and that a lot of people, especially with the Hondas and Toyotas, but BMW is pretty much the same too. With these aluminum engines, aluminum blocking heads, you know, you got to be careful not to run them hot because you can you can damage components in the engine. You know, pistons, rings, head gaskets, and stuff like that. So, but. Um, this N20, you really, really have to run it hot to d destroy it. Like, it's got to get hot, hot. But as far as, uh, like, the those new B-Series engines, like, it doesn't take much at all to um, to cook those engines. So, because they have more plastic parts and things like that. So, all right. So, back over here. So, that was one fault we talked about. The other one is the... Um, the environmental catalyst air sensor uh, outlet. So it says coolant temperature. Oh, basically, so this one may not really be an issue if we get the coolant leak fixed. Because basically what it's doing is saying that it's comparing the data from that sensor. And I can actually go in here and I can see more stuff. So I can read the codes and kind of, so he actually may be okay. But what I mentioned earlier, I mentioned, um, you see it's got 11.79 volts. So this battery is almost toast. So pretty much, let's see what we got here. So basically, this code that he has, he's got the, the radiated outlet temperature sensor fault short to B plus. So, um, where it says open circuit. It actually gives two or three. It's either open or short to B plus. So pretty much it's not, it can't read right like how it's supposed to. 
because you also got a main you got a you got a main um you got a main engine temp sensor that's on the engine that one's on the radiator so and then you also have this uh the environmental catalyst sensor that one is on the radiator now that's for your uh so that lets me know right now that this car has will refer to it's not the N20 engine but it's the N26 so the N26 is the California emissions or they call it the SULEVs for the suit the super ultra low emissions vehicle so so this one has the California engine in it so this right here give me a little bit of data I'm not even really finna read all of it but the main thing like it happened the maximum amount of times which is 255 times so that's like a counter but you know that they usually mean it would generally mean that the sensor bad or something like that but since we know we got a coolant leak the coolant's not uh, getting uh, probably up to that area so it can properly sense the coolant so that's when you get a check engine light so yeah these cars are very sensitive so you get a check engine light for pretty much anything out of the normal because it probably it is monitoring the temperatures and looking at different sensors and stuff like that. And in this case, this one is looking at the temperature between the environmental uh, catalyst sensor, which is on the radiator. So this one has that sensor on the radiator, which I don't know if it's over there or over here, but it's like a it's a fancy sensor that's built onto the radiator and it's got a uh, electrical connector. Maybe we'll see it once I take, cause I gotta take this air box out. But essentially what that is, this is a expensive, fancy radiator in this car versus a car that has a regular N20 in there. And I think, I wanna say this, this radiator, I gotta even see if it's an aftermarket option because if that fault was currently present, uh, hopefully it's related just to the, the temperature. And once, you know, we get the coolant leak fixed and all the coolant and everything, is uh, flowing through the system good. The sensors are able to read, the, the outlet temperature sensor on the radiator is able to read good. And it's able to determine and say, hey, you know, everything's good. So hopefully the computer will be happy. But let's say that sensor, the that, uh, environmental catalyst sensor that's actually on the radiator itself, if that sensor is bad, the only fix for that is to replace the complete radiator. And because that's like one of them those uh, California emissions parts. Some number one, uh, especially here in Georgia, we we get a lot of uh, those. You get a lot of cars from California due to the fact that uh, just might be working on these cars over time. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this ignition off, and very soon I am gonna be disconnecting the battery since I'm I'm gonna be working over here around like some of the components like I'm gonna have to move this hot wire down and stuff like that that's for the starter so I'm gonna be disconnecting the battery but what I was saying is yeah we, we, we generally get a lot of uh, cars down here in Georgia that are from California because California has stricter lemon lemon laws so let's say if a car goes in the shop for a particular something under warranty um out in california uh if they can't fix it i, I want to say um i think they get two times or something but they have stricter lemon law so a lot of the cars uh get bought back especially if they're new and under warranty and then after that uh, once they get resolved or whatever and, and resold a lot of times typically a lot of the used car dealerships in atlanta We'll buy those vehicles and sell them over here. A lot of the the other uh, big batch of um, California cars would be vehicles that um, have came off lease. Cause I mean, you got like out there in like Beverly Hills and Hollywood and stuff like that. Um, those clients out there, they're only leasing these cars for like a couple years and turning them in and once they get turned in, they have an overflow of cars that typically go to the auction. And then a lot of these other states kind of snatch them up because they're just 
decent buys because they can buy they can buy several of them at one time and just bring them to other states. So that's typically what you see. Because uh, and then also BMW they sell a certain level of Sula vehicles in other states, but most of those states are going to be uh, they're, uh, they're going to go the, the the states that the that the the engines like with this N26 would have went to. They're gonna go to like California. I don't. I'm not sure if New York is a Sulev state. I think some other crazy states like Vermont. It's a few other ones up there. It's like it's like four major states that have the super ultra low emission standards. So Georgia's not particularly one of them. All right. So we scan the vehicle. We know what 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 those codes are. And we kind of know why they are. So, more than likely, if uh, I actually got the car off, so that's not going to work. So, if we fix this coolant leak, we should be good at fixing the check engine light. So, there shouldn't be any any additional uh, things unless the sensor and the radiator is bad. And if that's the case, he has to have a new radiator. And like I mentioned before, that radiator may be on the expensive side. I'm not even sure if you can get one aftermarket. I haven't even uh, checked to see. But uh, so we got all we got all dealership grade parts here. So we got uh, if you guys are interested in those part numbers, um, I'm not sure which is the feed and which is the return line. But we got both coolant feed and return lines here. So. So this is them. We got the 292 and the 293. So those are new hoses. They got new O-rings on there. Got a gasket for the color converter. And then this bag here. I got all the uh the manifold gaskets. I got O-rings for the oil pressure line. I got new uh new nuts to secure the turbo. To the um, to the cylinder head, and then got the gasket for the oil drain line. So pretty much, I, I was saying before um, this this video because I you know I didn't want to make it too long, and plus it takes time to just get all the intricate little stuff. So I'm pretty much gonna uh, I'm gonna start getting it taken apart. Uh, and I'll just kind of just go through. Uh, I'll just go go through and just get a little content to let you guys know, uh, kind of, you know, what I'm doing or what processes I took. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some things apart, and I'll just chime in from time to time to let you guys just know the process of, uh, you know, just just what I'm doing and what it takes to do this uh, particular job so just pretty much to give you guys some insight of uh you know what to expect what to expect you know if you take this to you know your your local mechanic or your your bmw specialist I always recommend you guys if you got um when you choose people to work on your vehicle make sure they actually specialize in that particular um product like you know make sure there's somebody who's familiar with bmws because these cars are a lot different from um, other vehicles, um, and today, and, and, and today they're a lot more simplified now than they they used to be. But they're um, some of them can be almost like jigsaw puzzles. Like you have to take things apart a certain way and put them back a certain way. Um, we've had a we got a V8 engine that's been out over uh, right now. It's probably over 15 years the N63 so that's one of those jigsaw puzzle motors like you know if you put something in the wrong spot it ain't gonna go and stuff like that so this right here is more simplified it's not too bad but still you wanna um, you just wanna you know have somebody that specialized in your vehicle that you have for the best results so cuz I've heard of uh, I think I've talked about this before, you know, 
Uh, just the quality of having somebody do good work. You know, you don't want to take this to the average shade tree or the average whoever to get your car fixed because, you know, like me, myself, like once people tell me that they went, they took it somewhere else and they want to bring it to me, it's like, I, I don't want to touch it because I don't want to go back behind anybody else to fix, you know, anything that may be messed up. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into it. All right, so I got this thing safely jacked up. Um, so I should be able to get to everything I need to get to and things like that. So I just wanna uh, give you guys a, a little bit of a disclaimer. I mean, you wanna be uh, extremely careful when jacking up uh, your vehicle because uh, they're just, um, they're just kind of very delicate cars. They're unibody cars. So a lot of times you jack up one area, you may start jacking up the rear too, just because of the way the body structure is. But uh, the main thing is you don't wanna you don't wanna damage anything and stuff like that. So it's pretty much just taking your time, jacking it up a little bit at a time, it's, uh, slow and steady until you can kind of get it supported like you want to. So I mean, this probably took me a good bit of just twenty. 25 minutes just because I want to be careful but um one little cheat one little cheat for me I would say using these um using these these rhino ramps um now this now the 4 series typically sits a little uh low in the front so a lot of guys that's probably doing like your own oil changes and stuff like that you know you probably find that it's going to be hard a lot of people have to get uh some of the lower ramps or what they call the race ramps um that a little bit more lower profile so you can actually because basically on some cars as you start getting ready to drive it up um that happened to me i believe one time on the six series grand coupe uh just trying to drive it i forgot what i was even putting those on there what i was even doing doing to that i don't i have no idea i remember doing brakes but i forgot what reason I, I needed the ramps to to move it up. I don't know. I don't even remember. But um, it's just in some cases, you know, as you're going up, you know, on the front, you may kind of touch the bumper on some of the cars. Maybe a three series, not as much, but a four series has a little bit of a lower ride height. So, so that's that. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm probably gonna take this wheel off so I can just get some better, that'll help me get a little bit more access in here. And then I got my creeper there. So um, I'm gonna start, get, start getting into it and um, probably gonna get, you know, most of this stuff out of the way. And then um, I'll come back and kind of chime in from time to time, let you guys know uh, what type of progress I'm making. So. Like I mentioned before, I'm gonna disconnect the battery. So the battery back here. So I'm gonna disconnect that ground cable. Uh, essentially, what that's gonna do? Um, looks like uh, he's already got a battery in here. I remember the, uh, I was saying the battery voltage is low. I'll let him know so maybe he can get this swapped out. Look like it's a car quest. So auto advanced auto part sells that, but it is an AGM. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get that loose, get that disconnected, and then from there, you know, I'll start rolling along on this thing. So the major, you know, I mentioned before in other videos. You know, it's super important to like disconnecting the battery, stuff like that. Cause some people, cause pretty much once you take this cover off right here, I got to loosen those screws, but I mean, are your power, you got, but that's the, the one of the main power cables right there. So if you accidentally uh, like drop a wrench there, accidentally touch it and it growls out, more than likely you're gonna blow one of the fuses in the back on the fuse carrier. So, I mean, it's just extra precaution to me. I really just disconnect the battery and know I'm good. Cause you know, sometimes, you know, you're working on things, accidents happen, things happen. You have a wrench or something slip, you're loosening something. And next thing you know, you're accidentally touching 
you know the terminal and you're like sparking so and in some cases you may have you know a fuel line disconnected or this that and the other so just to kind of you know promote safety and things like that it's better to just go ahead and disconnect the battery um the last thing you want to do is blow a fuse carrier um that part is probably like 150 dollars or you know you don't want to fry the computer or anything like that so so rather be safe than sorry so i'm gonna go ahead and get that battery disconnected and get all of this nonsense trims out of the way i want to say nonsense but you know i gotta get them out of the way so i can you know kind of get to what i need to get to so i'm gonna go ahead and do that and um I'll fire the camera back up and I'll let you guys know what I got going on and what I've done. All right, so here we go. Here's a little bit of an update of uh, what I've been doing. Um, so pretty much what I'm doing now. Uh, so as you can see, I got all the trams out of here. This is some of the parts. Some of the stuff is actually in the back in the back of the car or under the car uh so get all the trams out get back here uh i've started disconnecting the the o2 sensors because what i'm gonna do is remove the catalytic converter and just pretty much just drop it down and out but um i'm still working on this front side here gonna get this uh the fresh air pipe so that's basically fresh air that goes into the turbo the turbo inlet pipe i'm work, working on getting that out uh i've already got the screw loose that's what that extension you see hanging down there so that's what i'm doing there so i got a nice little swivel a swivel extension down there um so other thing i'm doing but uh i guess i'll go down here so I mentioned that I recently did one of these jobs on a 5 series not too long ago so um, so this car so far in some cases I want to say it may be slightly easier to uh, get this turbo loose and get it out so this is actually the screw right here on that charge inlet, inlet pipe and I was loosening it up right here so I could take that out of there. So be careful when to keep up with your your nuts and your screws. So basically up under here you can kind of see a little bit more. Let's see if I can actually angle this camera here. You kind of see where it's actually leaking from. So um, I mean that's definitely the turbo coolant lines. So it's coolant residue all up under here. So, I mean, it's pretty much clear as day, so. All right, so I got a few more things to do. I'm gonna get the inlet pipe out of there. I've already, this the charger pipe. I just, just basically unclipped that and I just swung it down and out of the way. So it goes right here. That's the charge air, the charge air pipe. So basically the air comes out of the turbocharger goes through that pipe to this intercooler here and then it goes around the, right there on the outside of the intercooler and it goes into the the throttle body up here so so there you go so that's pretty much how it uh how this four cylinder gets up the i think it's like 240 something or 250 horsepower so because this engine here, I think I mentioned it in one of my other videos. So the N20 is basically the replacement for the naturally aspirated, the naturally aspirated uh, inline six cylinder engine. So, so they wanted something, they wanted to retain the performance. So it pretty much has like equal performance as far as horsepower and torque. And a lot of that torque comes in at a lower RPM range over a naturally aspirated six cylinder, which is like the N52. Um, some people still prefer the N52 because it's not turbocharged. And you know, pretty much all BMW engines are 
uh, especially these newer engines, they're known for revving up up high. So as you test drive, as you drive the cars, you can get uh, six, seven thousand RPM if you punch it. So this motor here can still, I think, turn about seven thousand RPM, but the power does taper off in the upper RPM ranges as it has like a lot of low end and mid range torque and maybe I guess the horsepower probably peaks out. I'm not 100% sure because uh, I don't spend time studying the horsepower <laughs> graphs but I want to say uh, somewhere around like 5,000 somewhere around in there is probably peak horsepower and it has a, st st a, st a steady torque curve probably from like low rpm it could be 1300 1500 all the way up to like maybe 4500 so that pretty much means uh that's why a lot of these cars like if you're cruising them on the highway and stuff like that you know you only give it you give it just a little bit of gas and you can speed up uh, a little bit like it's, it's got that constant torque so these actually have more torque than the inline six cylinder engines so so basically you really don't have to get the rpms up on it you can just kind of just gradually press on the pedal uh same thing with the n55 especially the v8s because all of the engines now are turbocharged so one benefit of the turbochargers is you got you got more torque so you really don't even uh if you just gradually get on the pedal like if you let's say if you're cruising and you want to kind of just gradually pass somebody you can just you can just barely press on the pedal and just kind of scoop by somebody and get up to 80, 85 with that torque versus punching it up to 6,000 RPM. Of course, if you punch it up to 6,000 RPM, it's just going to take off. And depending on whether it's a six cylinder or a V8, it's going to be faster or slower. But, you know, but um, that's how BMW is able to achieve. The ultimate driving machine performance no matter whether it's something like this EN20 because I want to say this car can do 0 to 60 in maybe less than 6 seconds uh, it's probably mid like 5.558 or something like that I don't know but they have pretty decent performance especially when you compare them against like other vehicles with 4 cylinders like your Toyotas and your Hondas which have maybe about 56 or 60 horsepower less. So this right here, uh, if somebody gets out of a Camry and jump into this, they're gonna like the performance of this thing right here a lot better. So that's kind of how a lot of the uh, a lot of people uh, get addicted to the ultimate driving machine because they get a taste of the performance. All right, so I got the fresh air pipe. Well, this is basically the fresh air inlet pipe that goes to the turbo that uh, basically uh, where your filter air gets in and also a part of the crankcase system is tied in here too. So sometimes this thing can be a bit delicate. So I've seen them, them break here. And also sometimes this area right here, this thing right here separate where your crankcase hoses connect. So you want to be very careful when removing that because it is delicate. All right, so I'm still under here, but um, so basically I got the hand that pipe out of the turbo, so that's um, that's where it goes. So that's the front side of the turbo, and uh, it's a stud. It's a stud right there that secures the. Uh, fresh air pipe so that doubles is also a mounting area so there's a couple little screws there those I think they're like E12 so I'm gonna loosen those up and I'm gonna take that stud out that's gonna allow me to get the bracket out and then there's a bottom mount over there so that's my son over there on his tablet making all kind of noise but there's a so he's out here hanging out with me. So there's another bracket over there on the bottom of the turbo with a couple of screws that I gotta get. So 
Let me see here. So, a little tricky to see, but um, I don't know if you see those E12s, but there's like, two screws in that bracket I gotta get out. Then I gotta loosen this clamp and get this uh, cat out. So, I'm about to start working on that. And then um, I can start loosening the screws up there on the turbo. All right, so what I'm doing now, uh, I'm working on getting the cat out of here. Um, I've already uh, loosened the exhaust and moved it back a little bit. So, um, so I'm in the process of getting the catalytic converter loose or out. So, um, I got my, I got a couple. There's a couple 13 millimeters right here that I have loose on this bracket here and this bracket attached to the transmission so um, I just grabbed a couple tools to help me loosen that up and once that's loose I can go up there and grab the clamp and just kind of slide it down so that's pretty much the plan so I got my nice little compact mat coat um, 3 8 ratchet so just gotta get both of those loose and another thing I was gonna point out I got one of these little paint markers here so what I typically like to do I've already put a mark at the top but I kinda like to mark the clamp and the turbo I just put a couple little marks. That, that way it just kind of helped me line it up. Uh, I want to put another one on the turbo, which I probably will in a second. Just got to kind of... So something like that. So I can kind of... I can line my, my clamp up with the turbo, then get the, the cat kind of close to where... It can, it's only got so much area it can go, but as far as the clamp, the clamp is usually positioned in a certain area. So I'm gonna go to the, the top of the car and show you guys that. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and loosen this up, and then I'm gonna go to the top, and I'll show y'all guys the clamp up there. Two bolts that back it out is nice and loose. So after I loosen that clamp at the top, shit, be able to get the cat out of there. Um, I figure out what I do with my other bolt. So here we go. Both of the bolts they go through that bracket through the transmission. So I'm keep trying to keep up with my screws there. So I got my little parts tray. So now I'm going up here. And there is a clamp right over here. So I'm going to loosen that clamp there where that little 13 millimeter is. And I should be able to get the, uh, the catalytic converter out of there. And once I do that, I'll be, I'll be cooking with a, what I call a, what I refer to as a, a pot of hot grease. And, and uh fish oil so we'll be moving along pretty good nice and steady so that's the next thing i want to say i got my i still got to get this o2 sensor this is the four cat o2 sensor um this is the after cat one there so so i'm gonna get that loose and work on that and then I'm going to take this little heat shield right here out and get that out of there. And then I should be almost ready to start getting the turbo out then. Uh, next up, there's a couple more things. The oil supply line that's at the block. And the turbo coolant lines that attach to the turbo right here. So, those lines right there are usually a pain in the butt. Uh, 
but since it's leaking as bad as it's leaking, hopefully the O-ring is split or something, and they just slide right on out. Because usually you have to sit there and fight with them to get them out. So we'll see. All right, so I'm still cruising along. So I was able to get my my tool in there, get the clamp loose on the turbo. So this thing, I just have to kind of just uh, I got that loose. This is. That's the screw for the clamp. So I got that thing loose. Um, cruising along pretty good. So I probably got to get like a pry bar or something to kind of just break the tension on that clamp. Then that catalytic converter be loose. So also, um, I think I mentioned earlier the. So this right here is the power cable. This the hot. The uh, this goes down to the starter, and I think, I think somewhere uh, it connects and joins over to the alternator that sits down there somewhere. This is, this right here. So yeah. So, but anyway, I know that. So basically, I loosened this up because this kind of routes. It's got like a little holder. Over there, it's like a little clip. You guys probably can't see it, but it's in there. And then the the wires for the O2 sensor right here, which I'm moving around, so I'm getting those out of the way. So even though I'm not like way back there in the back of the engine, I can just kind of clear my way back there. I've done quite a few of these to kind of know that that's there. So. I kind of work those out, work those down, get those out of the way. And that's pretty much why I pretty much mentioned and just we're just kind of just briefly talking about why I did why I disconnected the battery. So um, in some cases, uh, a lot of us, and I've I've done that too. I will just disconnect this connection from right here. But the, the problem is that's still hot. And if you accidentally drop a tool or something like that, you can possibly, uh, you know, create sparks or cause damage to other things. So, so I got that loose. So my O2 sensor wires are here for the catalytic converter. Okay, next up. Um, another thing while I was in here, because uh, I got the heat shield out right there. But you know, while I was in here, I see traces where the valve cover gasket is starting to leak. And also right here, uh, I'm gonna have to get a light. Let me see. All right, right here, you kind of see where the valve cover has been leaking kind of uh, around the spark plug what well, ignition coil areas. Um, it's not like, well, it's starting to get bad. It's not like bad yet, but it's not like all over the exhaust and stuff yet, but it has some traces. So pretty much what I do in a situation like this, I just take pictures and just send it, send it to the owner of the car and just let them know, hey, at some point in time, you're gonna need to replace this, this valve cover. Um, this car has over 100,000 miles. I think it's like around 123, 124. So I would recommend replacing the complete valve cover assembly because this uh, thermoplastic here, over time, it heats up, it warps. So sometimes you can get away with just replacing the gasket. and But other times, also this one has this uh, built-in crankcase vent valve. So a lot of times they have a diaphragm in there that can rupture and you can get crankcase leaks. So it'll, um, if that diaphragm is ruptured, you'll basically be getting an air leak here. This one has the vacuum line that goes right here to the air box because it's the Sulev. This is the N26 engine. It's pretty much an N20. They just give it uh, a different engine code. A lot of this stuff is very similar to the N20, but it's the N26 because of the additional emission control components that are on here. So, but yeah, this crankcase vent vent valve is built in. That diaphragm ruptures. Um, you can get like smoke out of it, exhaust and other things too, but most commonly 
you'll have a, a, a real strange whistling noise. It'll be hooting and hollering and things like that. So um, on this particular engine, that's the indication that the, the crankcase vent valve inside the valve cover is defective. And this one, you can't replace it separately. It's built in to the cover. So at this mileage uh, for an oil leak, that's what we normally recommend is to replace the complete valve cover. So I got all that out of the way. So I'm gonna get my pry bar and kind of pry that clamp loose. All right, so you guys probably noticed that I put another fender cover on here. So the reason for that, I bought this one as a backup with me, but it is a little bit longer. So it covers a little bit more up around the headlights and stuff like that. So. I've been liking this fender cover a lot. Uh, this is when I got off the snap-on truck. It's a little bit more expensive than those. I want to say it's about $80. $80. But one of the nice things I like about it is uh, I've actually used this on my truck too. Um, I replaced the radiator in it and I did a water pump. And I used this on there and it just was really nice. But it has sand up here in this area here. So they refer to this as a weighted fender cover. So that means that the sand kind of puts weight on it so it don't slide down. So sometimes like these right here, they'll have the tendency to like slide down. Well, this one's just, this one's just flipped. But sometimes the wind blows or whatever, they can slide down and fall off. But more importantly, I just kind of moved this, this extra one I had. So pretty much these two right here, I keep these at home with me because I've got a bunch of them at work and I've bought them. Sometimes they'll, like the older ones will kind of wear out. I may throw those away, but I, I, I've actually bought a couple to have here, you know, with me at my house. But basically I relocated this one right here to the center. So they kind of protect, because you know, I've been over in towards the middle of the car, diving in here, doing things. So this kind of makes it easier to kind of just protect, you know, this, this nice, new painted bumper so but i got my pry bar here and um i'm pretty much going to pry on this clamp to kind of just get the get that bad boy to pop loose so the other thing i did i went on and those two screws that i took out the bottom of the transmission for the for the uh for that bracket i put one of them in there just a little bit so as i pop this down that thing button doesn't come popping down or come the, the cat don't come falling out. So what I normally do, I'm just gonna rotate this around a little bit. And you can see it's loose. Well actually the camera in, in the wrong direction. So it, it pretty much just fell out of it right there. So pretty much from there, I'm gonna go to the bottom and I'm gonna grab it and take it on out. All right, so you guys can't really see that extra bolt that I put in there, but it's the one at the bottom. So just loosening it up, pull it out of there, and hopefully. bad boy to slide on out of there so but get it out of there with the clamp and now we can really get up in here and see what's happening so got all kinds of good room up in here now I can see I can see everything up in there so really um, Very, very close. So basically, you, got, you know, once you get the cat out, get all kinds of room to get that turbo out there. So that's the oil supply line right here where it goes to the block. It's like a T30 right there. Um, 
and in here it's a little different because the way the subframe is actually it's a lot more it's a little bit better usable room in this uh car versus a five series or three series even though it is built a little different um i'll probably tell you guys the reason for that i think now this is that would be my opinion so i just try to give you guys a little disclaimer like pretty much uh you know the, the the stuff that I'm working on, the things that I do. So the things on this channel are pretty much uh, from my perspective as a technician um, and things like that. So I'm not an engineer. I'm not a salesperson, or anything like that. But a lot of times, you know, us technicians have a few uh, opinions, um, you know, about things that. You know BMW has done over the years and things like that but so so the coolant lines I, I really can't see those a whole lot from this angle um so in some vehicles the way to sell like the um, actually right here I can see them real good so I mean the rack the, the electric power steering rack is right here, but I still got room to reach up in there. So, um, it's a T30 in there somewhere between there. And hopefully I can work those out. So, I was mentioning before that those two hoses are, are a pain in the behind to get out of there. So, uh, got to work those out. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is a three series. So, the three, well, a four series, but the the three and the four so an f30 and the f32 and even the f33s they share this subframe and this platform and even some of the grand coupes um the four series grand coupe which they started doing on these body styles here so one of the only differences is like this little brace here a lot of convertibles in the coupes will get some extra bracing um in the car um but the, fi the five series i working on it was um it, which is the f10 so it's the f10 528 i think it was about a 2015 model or something like that so um this vehicle right here pretty much like this engine was built for this vehicle uh, what I mean by that, from the start of production, pretty much the the F30, which is the 2012 3 Series, pretty much debuted with the uh, the N20 in there, which is this four cylinder. So, and then at that time, the F10 5 Series it came out in 2011, so it was already out. So basically, um, they probably already had it pre-engineered. And plan to put the N20 in the 5 series anyway, which is the F10 by the style. But the first year, the first year, the, the 2011 528 came with the N52, which is the inline six cylinder naturally aspirated. So, of course, that car has a different subframe. Usually, the 5 series, the 6 series and the 7 series they 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 well back then they shared a lot of commonalities and stuff so the subframe and the engine mounts and things like that were a bit different on that but this subframe in this car is different like the motor mounts and stuff like that so in my opinion it's a lot easier to get the turbo out of uh this vehicle right here uh which is the F32 and possibly I'm I'm thinking the 3 series is very similar there are a few di differences uh, because, of course, this is a coupe and a F30 is a, a the three series is a four door, but a lot of the, the body layout and stuff like that is very similar. So it's just like a lot of more room in this area here versus a F10 and 5 series, even though the engine bay is a little bit bigger because, you know, you figure some of those came with V8s and even the six cylinder. Some of these actually, uh, you can get a, a, a 530, I mean a 335 and a 435 with the N55 in here. And of course, you know, they got the, you can get an M, you get an M3 or M4 with the S55. 
So you get one of those, it's a lot of stuff up under the hood. Taking up real estate, like you got dual air boxes and all that stuff. But um, as far as the turbo coolant lines, um, so a lot of times what I'll do, I'll pull the pin on the wastegate for this turbo to get this, the, um, this linkage to drop down. So that gives me more room to, to kind of work those lines out. Even though it's not really totally in the way, but I just want to be able to kind of get to them. So there's a little bracket back here that holds the, the power wire. And, the, and there's also a support for the O2 sensor wires. So I'm going to move that out of the way. Um, I'm going to try to do my best to get the, the turbo out um, today. And then tomorrow I'll, I'll go back together with it. Just because it's just a, it's a Saturday and I got to spend some time with the family and things like that. So, um, there we go. All right, so I'm back on this, on this project here. So what I'm doing now, uh, just to let you guys know, just to kind of make things easier. Cause sometimes, you know, when you're taking the turbo out, um, most likely, like on new, I believe the repair instructions say that you can pull these out from the top on this model, uh, which you probably can if you rotate it a certain way, or I can get out from the bottom. But just kind of make it a little bit easier to come out of there. I went on and removed the electronic wastegate valve. So this is it right here. Um, this can be replaced separately if it sets any faults. Um, so it's basically two T45s that hold it on. I got them right there in my tray. So just to kind of get that out of the way, so, cause you know, I wouldn't wanna, cause sometimes, you know, these things could be a little tricky to get in and out. And that little extra, the little, the motor part of that thing is kind of up here. So it just kind of make it a little awkward. It's a little bit more of just a cum cumbersome piece on that's on there. So if you, I don't want to accidentally drop it down and damage that or while I'm trying to get it out, it makes it harder for me. So I went on and removed it. Uh, so I went on and got my, my T. I probably could have got that from the bottom too. So that's another thing the wastegate, getting that out of the way, helped me do. So I got my mirror down in there and I got the screw loose. But, uh, I was actually starting to get some of these bolts loose and things like that and just pretty much me judging things um, I just kind of I don't know I got the feeling that uh, not too long ago or somewhere whether, whether this thing was under warranty at a BMW dealership or went to an independent shop for something they took the turbo out for something um, and it's possible they didn't put either new O-rings or it's possibly something that they did. Because just looking at how how new those screws look. And then the other thing is when I was cracking some of them loose. Because I went on and started cracking some of them loose with my, uh, just the tool set up here. So it's a T50 that you can use. So I recently uh, bought this T T50 off the the Matco truck because um, usually what I would use is just a regular T50 and some extensions but having one that's the appropriate size this one actually was longer and I had actually had to make it shorter so you can kind of do that you can modify the tool by putting it in the vise I did that at work that's what I did the other day so I, sh I, I, I took about an inch out of it to make it nice and short so you can maybe t take a punch, you can take a punch over and knock that center piece out and shorten that thing up. So I did that to kind of make me a kind of custom special tool, I guess, if you will. But pretty much when I was taking some of those, uh, when I was taking some of those nuts off, those T50 nuts, well, I haven't taken them all the way out yet, but you know, I noticed that they were loose. It didn't, some of them didn't take much effort to crack loose. so. That's an indication that somebody's been in here, and yeah, all they did, you know, they did snug it up, but it wasn't all the way tight. 
because there's a particular uh, torque sequence on here and by me just doing one of these jobs the other day I just uh, so I, I pretty much kind of know like how tight those are supposed to be and I, I, they were snug it was holding in place no signs of exhaust leak or anything like that but I know somebody's been in there because those other nuts are new so I'm not sure exactly what they replaced maybe if I take it out I may be able to tell what they did but they probably obviously didn't replace the turbo coolant lines or either they didn't put uh o-rings they didn't put the ceiling rings on there so i'm gonna go ahead and um uh, get this thing loose um i make sure you guys me attempting to work those those coolant lines off um so I got my drain pan up under there, so just in case it leaks down, which it is. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't think this engine, I think most of the coolant uh, has leaked. Well, I want to say it, because the expansion tank is still showing a little bit there, so. But I don't expect a whole lot of coolant to come out. Y'all probably hear all that old school music. That's one of my neighbors up the street. He's out, he's out here. Uh, He's, he stays a few houses up the street. He's out there jamming. So, this is a typical Saturday evening sometime. You know, they'll, they'll be uh, chilling out with their friends, having a few beverages to drink, and listening to some music. But I got my garage up, so I can hear them. But uh, I actually got my music back over here, too. But uh, a lot of times... I either turn it down or I won't be playing it so I don't get any copyright strikes. But I got me a little, uh, I was actually just bumping some music, but I just turned it down. So let me see if I can get, uh, now one thing I don't want to do is get coolant on my camera, but um, I'm trying to have a good angle here where we can see up in there. I've already got that T30 screw out. came in through the bottom like maybe through this way and try to reach up here but I just kind of got a magnet I got a mirror and put my uh, and put my um, what was it a T30 I kind of worked my T30 in there and got it on there and loosened it up from up top here so let's see here Loose. All right, so typically what I use to attempt, what I'm gonna use to attempt to get that other line out is I'm gonna try to use something like this. So the main thing in this car Um, this car is kind of unique because I'm just kind of I'm just kind of excited that I have all this room right in here to get to the turbo and I mentioned I keep comparing this to a F10 5 series that I just recently did which I mean it's a 5 series so it's a bigger car it has a lot more room uh, in the engine compartment, but the engine compartment is still kind of designed a little different because the suspension set up on the F10 Like a lot of this like a lot of the comp so basically all this extra area here is more flat So like where my hand is this is more flat so basically all this from here to here Is basically walled off. It's, I mean, it's just a different engine compartment um I mean, you still can get the job done, and it's not as bad. But uh, this car is a bit of a different setup. But yeah, it is easier as far as 
getting this turbo out of here. I haven't got it out yet, but uh, pretty much after I, I get that other the other coolant line loose, it's gonna be ready to rock and roll. And I kind of got this back. I'm trying to get my camera down here as far as I can. So that's the other coolant line that I gotta get. Hopefully, sometimes you can kind of rock them back and forth. So hopefully, that one pops out just like this front one here. I can actually wiggle it. It's not even much, much pressure on it. But like I'm, like I've been telling you guys, it's, it's, it's normally not that easy to pop them out. So, hopefully, I can get this in there at a good angle and just kind of pop it out. It should come straight out. And then I'm get the rest of these nuts out of the out of there and get this turbo out. All right, so I got my, my nice little snap-on long, it's kind of a little panel popper, and I was able to reach up in here. Let's see here. I was able to kind of reach up in there and get that joker popped out. So, got that out of there. So I thought that's typically one of the worst parts of the job is uh, getting those turbo coolant lines out of the turbo. And these just literally just kind of popped out with little or no effort at all. So they did not fight me like the ones I did the other day. I want to say I spent 20 to 25 minutes trying to get some out on the last ones I did. So I guess they were leaking so bad. So they just, you know, they just came on up out of there. So now a few more things I got to get. Um, the reason you gotta take the turbo out of here is because the those cooling lines actually go through to the engine block and they kind of go through this little kind of this little hole here. So that's the way to go. getting these bolts out but on a lot of them the stud is coming out too so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna spray a little bit of PB blaster down in there and hopefully I get these to loosen up um, but I did bring a few I brought a few studs from work as a backup just in case I have this issue all right so I got most of my screws out of here so pretty much what I'm doing now, every time I turn my headlight on, it makes those lines on the camera. I guess it depends. Uh, when I put it in that light mode, it doesn't make the lines don't seem like. But if I put it on the on the other one, it makes them. So, so what I'm doing now is just hitting the rest of these uh, rest of these nuts out of the turbo. All right, so here we go. Um, I got one more screw in the middle, yeah. but but this thing is it's loose. It's ready to come up out of there. So um, I'm pretty much just gonna get that screw loose. Let me see. So I got I got all my connections. Um, you guys can't probably see it from this angle, but the blow off valve here. I got that disconnected. So I 
Let's disconnect. Just make sure I got everything disconnected. So, so basically, um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna just slide the turbo down and let the coolant hoses kind of go through there. Um, they kind of go over the housing and through the block, so they just kind of just stick through like that. So. I'm just gonna let me get my tool here. Y'all probably hear that music. It gets pretty loud because I, I can see the I can I can see the audio signal going off on my camera. But yeah, that's my my neighbor. Uh, he's having church over there where he listen to gospel. But yeah. He's having a good old time over there. So you, you hear the music in the background there. He's a couple houses up and you can hear it way down here. All right, All right so that's the last boat. And they also came out with the stud, which is that. See, did I forget to take something off? Oh, yes, I did. And and that would be the the turbo drain line. So, because I really don't, I really don't want to risk uh, damaging that. So I'm just gonna kind of like put a. Put a couple of these screws in there. Just gonna kind of just snug it up a little bit. Then I'm gonna go. It's two uh, T30s under there, so because I got the gasket for it. So I'm just gonna stick it back up real quick and do that. All right. So the hold up of why well, can't get the turbo all the way out. So you just saw a few, uh, a few minutes ago I was able to get it down and back, but not all the way out it's because of the, uh, the 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 oil drain line. So. Pretty much what I did, I just put a couple little nuts up there to secure the turbo so I can get this loose. This right here is the gasket that's between there and the, and the oil drain line, so I'm going to replace that gasket. And uh, I'm going to put that together and re-secure it with those, those T30 torque screws. So, let me see here. We're going to try this again, round two. All right, here we go. So there we go. It's down and out. Um, I really don't know if I can pull it up through this way or not. Guess I'll see what I can do. But worst case scenario, I can grab it from underneath. underneath and feed it through um it's actually back enough right there i can replace those those lines because those lines are right about there i have to zoom out a bit so those are lines right there see from this angle. but once i get the turbo out once i get it out i'll show you guys what they look like
All right, so it's a little bit of a tight fit for it to come out, but I do got it out. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, I got it out, but it is a little bit of a tight fit to get it out. Grabbing this cardboard here, because you know it's oil and coolant in there. Try to get some of my tools out of the way, but I'm gonna put it right here so you guys can see it. So that's it right there. So that's pretty much how messy it got with just all the coolant that was leaking leaking around there from those turbo coolant lines so it's got all that crust build up and stuff like that so these are those gaskets that I'm going to replace now this looks like a I'm trying to see if this oil feed line has the the check ball in there I don't think it does so I mentioned that just based off it seemed like some of the bolts being loose that no so this this one right here doesn't have the check ball in there which is okay it's just some of them um, the check valve just pre prevents um, the vehicle from smoking after it's set overnight. All of the all of the vehicles don't have that problem, but some of them did. Um, so yeah. So this is a turbo out of the car. Um. And another good thing to do is to to spin it, check the turbine, make sure it's spinning good. And this is uh the wastegate here so that's working good it's not binding so that's out of the way uh, pretty much the reason for getting that out of the way I'm gonna show you in a second